gives me a, a great pleasure to be in the midst of you and to speak on a subject which I have found it very fascinating uh, for a few months when I started researching this subject. And as uh, your director and my friend Mr. Mohanty put it, <coughs> there cannot be a, a better contemporary subject like death penalty which evokes our emotions either way, either you are for it or against it, either for you are for retaining it or for abolishing it. And there are equally valid reasons, equally sound reasons being advanced by both the groups, abolitionists and the retentionists. Well, it is a worldwide debate as you all know and the death penalty uh, has been abolished by a majority of the world countries. It is still retained in uh, some countries like United States and China. And within the United States also you have a few states which have abolished it, historically speaking. And for very, very sound reasons. Now, as you all know, death penalty <coughs> has a number of, uh, uh, I mean, there are a number of grounds on which the retention is argued that it should be retained, like it has the power to deter future crimes. It has, it, it, uh, it, 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 deterrence is one major aspect, but we do not have actually figures to sustain this argument. Has the death penalty helped to de deter the future <coughs> murderers? It is very difficult to answer because we do not have data. And no agency, whether it is a government or a judicial agency, has bothered to collect data. Now, we will go into all this in the course of this lecture. But to begin with, uh, I would like to take you first to the historical aspect, the current legal aspect, and the contemporary issues. Contemporary issues, as you all know, there are five convicts facing death sentence whose mercy petitions have been rejected by the president, Mrs. Pratibha Patel. And these convicts have challenged the rejection of their petitions in various courts and the Supreme Court. I will be going into those uh, cases as well, mainly examining the grounds of their appeal and how, uh, what are the chances of their uh, succeeding in their respective appeals. Now, to begin with, what is the historical aspect? If you look at the historical aspect, during the freedom struggle, we find that Mahatma Gandhi was very much against death penalty. And during the constituent assembly debate, you know, we, ha we had a constituent assembly which debated for at least two, three years the various provisions of the constitution and com uh, come to a conclusion on which provision to be included and which provision not to be included. Then we got the Constitution of India, which was inaugurated in 1950. Now, during the constituent assembly debates, if you look at the number of volumes of uh, those at the constituent assembly, you find that the overwhelming opinion was in favor of abolition of death penalty. Because we had at least one of the constituent assembly members who had faced death penalty himself. And that member argued for the abolition. And we had Ambedkar, the father of the constitution, also arguing in favor of abolition. So, it, it is indeed a paradox how the post-independent governments in India began to support death penalty, keeping themselves aloof from the historical uh, legacies and the constituent assembly's overwhelming emphasis on abolition. Now, the question is, if the constituent assembly had indeed supported abolition, why did they not enacted. Why, why did? Why can't they? Why, they could have uh, included the abolition. They could have abolished the death penalty right then and there. They did not do so because they left this issue to be decided by the future parliament. Because there were a number of consequent changes to be made in the laws, and they thought the in parliament, which is likely to uh, be formed after the general elections, will be in a better position to enact suitable laws to abolish death penalty. But that did not happen. There were uh, 
number of uh, what do you call private members bills moved by members of parliament seeking abolition of death penalty as it always happens the private members bills <laughs> failed to get enough support and they lapsed now <clears throat> i'm not going into the instances there are at least five instances of private members bills uh, let me not go into all those details <clears throat> but let me give you a overview of uh, <coughs> what exactly is death penalty in the indian uh, law legal system as you know the way very word suggests it's a penalty and death penalty exists apart from other penalties we have what is what is called indian penal code which uh, enumerates the various penalty uh, punishments for various crimes now what are the punishments for various crimes apart from death penalty if death penalty is immoral unethical you cannot take away the life of a person however hard the criminal is so what are the other punishments available to the courts the other punishments are life imprisonment the second is a rigorous imprisonment for a fixed number of years and rigorous imprisonment is always accompanied by hard labor the third alternative is simple imprisonment again for a fixed number of years the fourth alternative punishment is forfeiture of property the court can sent, uh, sentence a criminal at, on conviction and say that his property should be forfeited no need for uh, you know imprisonment or death penalty or whatever and the fine simple fine will do that is also an independent punishment now these forms of punishment also can also be coupled together there can be fine as well as imprisonment there can be forfeiture of property as well as fine as well as imprisonment now death penalty is distinct in the sense if you are if the, if the criminal if the convict is given death penalty the other forms of punishment need not be thought of because that is the end of the matter <clears throat> now all this uh, forms of punishment uh, are contained in section 53 of the indian penal code now when you come to the section 54 of indian penal code it talks about the commutation of uh, death sentence to any other punishment now the court gives a verdict now the executive says okay these are the facts but executive has a power to commute the sentence from death to life life to other forms of punishment because considering the overall aspect of the situation the convicts mercy petition and the uh, certain grounds on which the executive can come to a conclusion that the judiciary has wrongly given this verdict then also the uh, the executive can take a stand that a convicts Uh, sentence has to be commuted in the larger interest so that is why you have this section 54 in the indian penal code now section 55 also says the life imprisonment of a convict can be commute, commuted to a term not exceeding 14 years that we always say oh life sentence means 14 years actually life means life for the entire life for the entire duration of the life of a convict but in practice the most of the life sentences of convicts are reduced or commuted to 14 years unless now the uh, question is is death penalty uh, given only for murder or are there any other crimes that elicit murder uh, elicit death penalty it will be a matter of surprise if one has to be if one is told that it's not just murder that entails death penalty in india there are at least seven other crimes what are those crimes you have section 121 of the indian penal code which says whoever wages war or abets the waging of war can also be punished with death but these are all very vague terms waging of war against the government of india uh, incitement to war these are again very vague terms an accelerate can be uh, held guilty of war. Uh, so called next life in a legit next life moves can be booked under this provision but he may have an ideological reason to oppose the government of india he may have an ideological reason to uh, you know to educate people why they should rise in rebellion against the government of india 
but then he may not necessarily indulge in violence but this provision can be in, uh, invoked against the uh, person the accused and finally death penalty can be given it's a very dangerous uh, very uh, 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 i mean controversial provision which we have in our uh, in our court but this has not equally elicited uh, the attention the concern of the uh, freedom loving people as the very offense of murder has in section 132 we have the abatement to abatement to duty if that is a mutinous situation and if you are accused of abetting then also you are held guilty and you can be given death penalty then you have section 194 which says if you fabricate evidence with intent to uh, procure conviction of a capital offense if you fabricate evidence with intention to procure the uh, uh, conviction of capital offense of some other person then also you will be held guilty and you can be given death sentence not many might have heard of this provision but it exists in our statute books then you have this standard section 302 of ipc which talks about death penalty as one of the forms of punishment for murder the other form is life imprisonment then you have section 305 which says abatement of suicide of child or an insane person if an adult person abets the suicide of child or insane automatic punishment is murder uh, a death sentence then you have section 307 indian penal code it says if there is an attempt to murder and if the convict is already undergoing a sentence then that uh, convict has to be given death penalty this, this is an interesting uh, aspect because we had uh, one more provision in the indian penal code it's called section 303 indian penal code which imposed a mandatory death sentence on a convict who had uh, uh, you know who had committed another murder so there the provision said the, the the sentence will be automatically death sentence now section 3 303 of the indian penal code stands deleted by virtue of the supreme court's judgment the parliament did not delete it supreme court said this was unconstitutional you cannot impose a mandatory sentence on a convict it is the courts which have to decide considering the facts and circumstances of the case whether the convict deserves a uh, capital sentence or not so the statutes cannot uh, on their own say when there is an option of a life sentence and a uh, death sentence the the statute cannot say mandatorily a convict who is undergoing a sentence commits another uh, uh, murder will be will be given the death sentence so that provision stands uh, deleted because of the thanks to the supreme court judgment now we have another provision 396 decalty with murder that is also entailing death penalty as you, as you know this these are not exclusive uh, death penalty provisions this is the option is always there death penalty or life imprisonment but in some cases the courts think that no the circumstances the grounds are such that a uh, life imprisonment cannot be considered that's a debatable issue we'll go into that later on <coughs> now apart from the indian penal code you have a number of other laws which also impose death penalty ap uh, apart from the other uh, uh, forms of punishment what are those acts these are basically security related defense of india related like air force act 1950 army act 1950 navy act 1950 Indo Tibetan Border Police Force 1992 Defense of uh, Internal Se Defense and Internal Security Act 1971 Defense of India Act 1971 Commission of Certain Prevention Act 1987 and Narcotics Act and so on and so forth so you have a great variety of laws which are considered death penalty as one of the options before the courts now what has been the history I mean, how how often the courts have been imposing death penalty? If we look at the uh, history; it's very fascinating. In the sense, the early years of independence, uh, after independence, despite the rhetoric which was uh, witnessed during the Constituent Assembly debates, and also the the period during the freedom struggle, when many of the freedom fighters had undergone life imprisonment, 
and various situations and uh, you know some one of them at least had faced uh, gallows if you listen to that uh, uh, freedom, uh, member of the constituent assembly who had uh, uh, who had been punished with death and he escaped from the gallows thanks to the various uh, happenings during the freedom movement he says at least 10 of the convicts during his term in prison he, sh he was sure that they were innocent but they were set, put to death so the possibility of innocence being put to death despite the legal safeguards and whatever you can think of was predominant in the uh, minds of the abolitionists so here is a, they said here is a provision even if one judge makes a mistake you cannot reverse it because the person is gone so this is a serious thing this calls for uh, a serious debate and needs to be abolished so that we can think of alternative measures if we look at the united states for example the, 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 the six or seven states which have abolished the death penalty they have necessarily included the uh, life in prison as an alternative in their statutes for those cases which deserve death penalty they said okay life in prison for the entire life no question of remission they clearly said but why we can't think of similar measure in india we can also say life imprisonment means there is no question of remission life means life for the entire uh, the, the remaining part of the life the, uh, the convict has to undergo life imprisonment as an alternative to death penalty this could be considered <coughs> now what is what is the history what is the history of india uh, the post independent history of india says the post independent history of india says that <coughs> at least for the first few years first two decades the 50s and 60s death penalty was a sort of de facto punishment for murder you come across a murder case the trial court imposes death penalty straight away they don't even think oh life in prison may be an alternative so that period does not come so 50s and 60s death penalty as a de facto punishment now 1970s it becomes an exception in the sense okay use it sparingly the government say uh, tell, told the courts use it sparingly impose it sparingly consider life sentence as an alternative punishment now despite that the courts you know have been happily imposing death penalty that's a different issue then you have the ma first major amendment in uh, civ uh, the criminal procedure code in the mid uh, 70s 1973 probably which says the uh, <laughs> judge concerned must provide specific reasons why he is imposing death penalty that is one more check earlier the situation was different earlier the situation was that the judge concerned must provide reasons if he is not giving the death penalty so that was the reason why death penalty became the de facto punishment in the 50s and 60s but 70s major step forward Said, okay, you can impose death penalty, but give reasons why you are imposing. That becomes another check. The judge has to exercise his mind and invent reasons why it's an exceptional case, why it deserves death penalty rather than the life imprisonment. Now, experience suggests that even that did not act as a check on the way the courts delivered death penalty one after the other. Then you have the major Supreme Court judgment in 1980, Bachchan Singh case, where the court's uh, five-judge bench, it's a constitution bench, which went into the question because the petitioner in that case had challenged the constitutionality of death penalty. The petitioner argued that it's violative Article 21, which guarantees right to life and liberty. The court went into the question, and four out of five judges <coughs> said, "No, it is." perfectly constitutional and only one judge dissented he was justice bhagavati he said no it's not constitutional it violates article 21 but he was in a minority the majority held the ruling so according to the majority view they propounded the doctrine of what is called rarest of rare doctrine what is this rarest of rare doctrine despite the best efforts the doctrine is not amenable to easy definition to date as recently as uh, uh, in, in August or September, Justice uh, Morkande Kajju, who had retired and is now the chairman of the press council, he had delivered a judgment in one of the murder cases. 
which came to him in a peak. He said, rarest of rare doctrine is not amenable to easy definition. I mean, that itself is a reason why there has to be a moratorium on the death penalty across the country. But he still went ahead and confirmed death penalty in that case, saying it's a rarest, of, it, it fulfills the doctrine of rarest of rare. But having accepted that it's, it's not easy to define because it's so complex, you cannot uh, identify the uh, ingredients of the doctrine with exactitude. So having said that, he went ahead and confirmed it. But that, again, we'll come to that uh, contemporary aspect a little later. Uh, <coughs> now the, the, the question is, how did we move from here? Uh, the ra rarest of rare doctrine, if you look at the uh, Bachchan Singh judgment, there is a crucial mm -hmm. sentence in that judgment explaining why it is called rarest of rare. I mean, rarest of rare in the sense, certain features of the crime which are not ordinarily present in other crimes. So, the severity of the crime, the, uh, the, the state of the victim, the helplessness of the victim, there are a number of features, the brutality of the crime, whether the conscience of the, uh, conscience of the society is aroused as a result of the crime, so these are factors you know, where the opinions can differ, but still the court said this would be the reasons. But they added one more qualifying part to that sentence where they defined the rarest of rare. Provided the alternative option, alternative option of sentencing is foreclosed, is uh, without doubt foreclosed, which means the alternative option of sentencing is life sentence. The court has to decide whether the alternative option of life sentence in that particular case is undoubtedly closed. How do you arrive at this finding? The court cannot do so independently. The court cannot do so, in a, cannot supplement its opinion uh, in the place of a finding, a firm finding. So how, do, how does the court do that? The court has to ask the prosecution. So the prosecution says this convict deserves that sentence. So the court should ask the prosecution, how do you suggest that the, uh, the, li uh, the life of prison cannot achieve the same purpose? Okay, this criminal, uh, I mean, is a menace to the society. This convict is a menace to the society. If released, don't release him or her, keep, uh, keep the convict uh, uh, for the rest of the life. Will that serve the purpose? Why he cannot be kept? If you look at the US debate on the death penalty, <coughs> The, most of us think that oh, keeping the convict in jail is, means more expenditure for the government, more burden on the public etc. But if you look at the debate in the US, it's exactly the contrary. The contrary is, you know, killing the convict, in, uh, in, uh, implementing the death penalty is much more expensive than keeping the criminal in jail for the rest of the life. Well, it's a, uh, it's because some states in the US have this lethal injection. Some states in the US follow the hanging. So that there is no uniformity. Now, that apart, so what is the post-1980 uh, history? Has Bachchan Singh been effective in uh, putting curbs on the uh, implementation of death penalty? Well, the, the, the history of the post-80 uh, period is uh, very complex in the sense we have uh, several Supreme Court judgments saying in a, even simple cases of murder, oh, it's the rarest of rare case. They reach that conclusion very soon, very fast, without going into the uh, intricacies and of the whole situation, whole case, and the unique characteristics of the case. So they, most often the court says, the trial court, it comes to the high court and then the Supreme Court, they mostly say, yes, yes, it's the rarest of that. The conscience of the society is shaken. Of course, every murder, if you look at it objectively, every murder is brutal in itself. It's not possible to kill another person unless you employ brutal methods. So brutality of the crime, the severity of the crime cannot be the sole ground to decide whether it is the rarest of rare whether it, uh, it stands on a different footing from the other cases of murder. So you have to go beyond that and see whether uh, alternative sentencing is possible. 
So that the court had never done. Even the Supreme Court had never done. That's one major uh, complaint, major grievance uh, from by the abolitionists against the court itself. Now all you know this uh, five uh, convicts who are awaiting the gallows have moved the courts seeking justice. Now the latest report is that the Supreme Court which heard the case uh, two days back in the case of one convict, Buller, uh, they, they told the government to come up with facts about how many number, the actual number of uh, convicts are waiting for the, the sentence and uh, they want to give what guidelines. In my humble view, the court should introspect. The court should introspect in the sense the Supreme Court if it introspects must know that the reason for the delay by the president, which means the government of India, because the president of India doesn't act alone. She always decides cases on the, on the advice of the Council of Ministers, which is essentially the Home Minister. So the number of uh, mercy petitions pending before the president is approximately around 20. Now, how so many petitions are pending? Why presidents are not taking decisions fast? This is one re one question which keeps coming again and again. So, Abdul Kalam uh, did not want to take any decision on any of the petitions. So was Narayanan. Narayanan took decision only one case, where uh, he rejected the mercy petition, but that the uh, convict escaped the gallows thanks to the po political establishment. He was going the song. In, uh, in 2000, when uh, Narayanan was about to retire, he rejected his mercy petition because of the political pressure. He was about <coughs> to be hanged, but the political process came in the way. Politicians were from Tamil Nadu said, no, please forgive him. The government stopped the hanging. And then the file again went back to the successor president. And the successor president commuted the sentence. Now, imagine what would have happened if the government acted on the advice of Narayan. That was the only uh, uh, mercy petition which Narayanan rejected. Uh, Narayanan was a uh, very sensitive president who was always against death penalty. Now, Narayanan's successor, Abdul Kalam, he had also rejected a petition by Don Anjan Chatterjee in 2004. That was the last one. Uh, we have not had uh, any prayer hangings before Don Anjan Chatterjee for uh, at least seven years, between 1998 and 2004. And since 2004, we have not had any other hanging. Now, there is a period of lull. So people have interpreted it variously. People have said, oh, so the government of India has, has been very sensitive in this. And they have been very cautious. They have not uh, actually executed many people. Though the number of people awaiting the death sentence is more, they have not, the executor has not gone ahead with the speed which many people would have expected. Now, is there a rethinking? If you look at the, if you Google search Chidambaram, uh, Chidambaram statement on death penalty after he came to power, in one of the interviews he said, yes, um, replacing death penalty with the alternative, mm -hmm. with a mandatory alternative of life sentence mm -hmm. is one of the options the government is considering. He said it only once, I think much was heard about that, after that. Because the, the, there is some sort of a, uh, unenforced kind of silence in the media and the government and the, in the public discourse about the merits and demerits of death penalty, whether India should go in for abolition. I mean, we, the public is not excited about the whole thing because many of them think that, oh, death penalty is essential, we need it to curb crimes. But in, in practice, it's not that case because we have um, quite a lot of data to suggest that deterrence, the objective has not really been achieved over the years. And there has been a spurt in crimes, even with the uh, with the retention of the crime. Now the question is, <coughs> so what happens after Bachchan Singh in 1980, when the court evolved the doctrine of the arrest of Raya? The arrest of Raya doctrine, as we have seen, has not been helpful in uh, discouraging the courts from giving uh, verdicts in favor of death penalty in many cases. The court should introspect. So how could they introspect? Just look at the figures. In, after President Pratima Patel came to power, she had commuted the, life, uh, commuted the death penalty into life sentences in at least 10 cases. 
these 10 cases have reached up to the level of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has found the evidence strong enough to uh, conclude that yes, death penalty is warranted in those 10 cases. They have been waiting for the messy petitions to be decided. Now the President Prajipa Patel has come to the conclusion, no, these 10 cases deserve mercy. So what is the area of operation of the President and the Supreme Court? The Supreme Court is a final, as you all know, the appellate court, where the trial court imposes the sentence after due trial process, high court confirms the sentence, and the convict goes in for appeal, and then the matter is heard all over again. The, court, uh, the Supreme Court does not go into the evidence part, but sentencing part, it does go into whether it is justified or not. Now, after the Supreme Court found uh, that there, there are strong enough uh, valid reasons for imposing death penalty, the President rethinks what is the area of uh, operation constitutionally. He has Article 72 of the Constitution which says that President's power to commute sentences is independent of the Supreme Court. Supreme Court may have found evidence, but the President can reopen the entire evidence and see for herself whether it is justified, whether the court below have done anything wrong. So there may be situations where in a case the trial court enters a guilty verdict, gives a death sentence, the high court says no, the prosecution appeals, the Supreme Court says yes. So here you have a trial court and Supreme Court agreeing on death penalty, high court disagreeing. This is a good case for commuting. So the president says okay, three, uh, one of the one of the three in the courts have said that the sentence is not warranted. So why should not we commute? This is one ground. Another ground is you have three judges of the Supreme Court hearing the matter, and uh, one out of three says the sentence is not warranted. But two judges say yes, it's warranted. But the two will hold this way because of the majority. But as far as death penalty is concerned, there is a valid argument. Oh, we are, we are dealing with the question of the life of a convict. So that you, you can't really lend weight to the majority. Even if there is uh, one judge who says that the penalty is not warranted, let us not impose it. Let it be a disqualifying factor. But that has not been accepted. It's one of the arguments. So in the case of Buller, it will be interesting to uh, know. Uh, you know about the facts of the case. Uh, uh, Devinder Paul Singh Buller <coughs> was uh, involved in an attack on the Youth Congress uh, office in uh, 1993 and uh, he was responsible for uh, uh, he, was, uh, he was found responsible for the killing of uh, nine of the nine persons as far, apart from injuries to the youth congress president <coughs> he was found guilty first by the tada court now you know wh what is tada terrorist and uh, disruptive activities prevention act which was enacted in the 80s and it was allowed to lapse in the mid 90s now, the TADA Act said that the, uh, the statements to the police during the custody will form the part of evidence. We have a very interesting uh, aspect in the uh, Indian Penal Code and the Evidence Act which says that confessions to police cannot be considered as evidence because we have a long history of uh, police torturing the criminals to extract confession. The courts, that's why the laws in the court say Okay, deal with the confessions very, uh, very cautiously. You cannot consider the confession as a piece of evidence. It has to be uh, always rejected. If it is a confession in the police custody, it has to be rejected. You have to look for other pieces of evidence. Now, TADA made an exception to that because we had a huge number of uh, terrorism incidents taking place in the 80s and 90s. That is the whole uh, background to the enactment of TADA. So, TADA said, uh, pol confessions to the police can be considered as evidence. It was on that basis uh, Buller was convicted. Now the matter went up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said yes, uh, <coughs> that, that there was a uh, disagreement among these three judges. One judge said no, the uh, confession to the police was not valid despite Tada. So he has to be, uh, uh, the death penalty is not warranted. The two judges disagreed. So even then, it went up to the president. Now the question of president considering the mercy petition, that is also very, very interesting. Many uh, journalists do not know that uh, the president always decides the mercy petition on the basis of advice of the home minister. 
but in this uh, thing she cannot act independently and whenever she wants to act independently she has a different view she puts it forward to the home minister to reconsider so this is what happened in the case of kalam kalam in one case the case of uh, mahendra das who was one uh, one among the five convicts who were awaiting the death sentence he's from gauhati he, uh, he killed another person while in uh, while in advising students for another offense so in that case kalam had a different view he said this convict seems to be a psychological case he needs counseling rather than punishment he sent back a uh, file to then home minister home asked the home minister to reconsider the home minister sends the ba- sends back the file again saying i have reconsidered the death penalty is warranted then kalam signs on the file saying i know and then the home ministry points out that the president is bound by the advice of the council of ministers into the supreme court judgment since several case then the president agrees and uh, says uh, approves the death sentence as suggested and recommended by the government that is how you have you find that he is also one of the convicts who are facing the death penalty now the question the question of delay uh, <coughs> the question of delay in uh, finalizing the uh, mercy petition in considering the mercy petition arises due to several reasons now if you lo- uh, talk to the lawyers concerned they will say yes these mercy petitions can be disposed in 2 3 months maximum why should it take 10 years 11 years what is there in it but there are uh, strong reasons why delay is helpful to the convict as such because a quick decision means rejection also <coughs> if the petition is rejected immediately goes to the gallows but if the petition is kept pending for a number of years then it helps the convict now the question is whether the delay is warranted or not whether the due process is gone into or not the court said okay delay is not warranted but whether the president uh, or the governor consider governor also has powers of uh, uh, mercy uh, considering uh, mercy petitions but it's in a different plane but finally it comes to the president so we have some more time <coughs> so the president uh, goes through the mercy petitions and in terms of her own understanding of the whole issue and also the minister of home affairs advice in each and every case now what happens is the president uh, the, the the court said we will enter the picture only if the president has not applied her mind to the case supposing if she just acts as a rubber stamp and signs on the dotted lines as given by the home ministry without application of her mind then it's a fit case for reconsideration the court will say please reconsider supposing if uh, president has not considered the material you have for each convict you have a list of aggravating materials and a list of mitigating materials so the president is supposed to consider both the materials and come to a conclusion which weighs more so if the president did not consider the mitigating materials at all then that is again another fit ground why the president must uh reconsider the whole thing again <laughs> now why should it take because the common grounds as i see it in uh, this five convicts uh, peti- petition challenging the rejection is the inordinate delay the inordinate delay itself is the ground if the petition is not considered for a number of years after uh, confirmation by the supreme court and the convict is you know uh, almost uh, living on, uh, from day to day you know awaiting the death that is a mental torture the degree of mental torture which was not supposed to be inflicted on the convict even in terms of the statutes the statutes say death penalty not death penalty with the 10 years of waiting those 10 years of waiting also is a kind of punishment which was not envisaged in the law so the convicts have a legitimate right to challenge this delay if it is a undue delay if there is an extraordinary delay then they can challenge it saying what is the reason so the courts ask the government what is the reason please tell us why how this reason is justified the government comes and says no there are several factors there are number of mercy petitions to be considered so all this adds to the burden of the government apart from that the home ministry itself keeps changing its views this the government is hiding before the courts if you look at the uh, information which is emanating from the rti applications being filed by the home ministry it is the home ministry which keeps changing its views 
you have shivraj patil recommending death penalty in a particular case then chidambaram comes chidambaram takes back the file and says no compute you have home ministers changing their views what is the president supposed to do the, pre, the had the president accepted shivraj patil's or lk advani's advice many of the convicts could have been easily hanged president did not accept their advice and kept it pending the president has two choices one is to accept the other is not to reject but keep it pending the president cannot reject a recommendation by the home minister which is the council who represents the council of ministers he can return it for reconsideration of the council of ministers if the president if the council of ministers returns the advice for the second time then it is binding on the president president has to sign but even then the president need not sign but keep it pending but this is one area where the uh, constitution envisages some sort of discretion to the president the, the constitution does not say it in so many words saying the president can delay a matter but the presidents have always found a way out they can sit on the petition without deciding till the end of their tenure and pass it on to the successor that is how you have several petitions before the current president current president is seized with uh, uh, at least 30 petitions out of which and 10 she has commuted 5 she has rejected again uh, 50 20 petitions pending before her now the question is how to address the delay the delay aspect has to be considered in a overall uh, framework the the uh, courts have to consider whether the delay was justified if it was not justified whether delay itself is a sufficient factor for commuting the decisions so many of us who go by the newspaper headlines may think that oh absal guru does not deserve uh, commutation may be correct but in if you look at the uh, overall aspect of, of how the death penalty has evolved over the years you find that every convict whatever the gravity of the crime deserves a fair treatment before the law deserves an opportunity to be heard that is how you have um, uh, kazab also getting a fair trial and then going up to the supreme court supreme court says you will hear the petition and you will have an opportunity to file a mercy petition before the president because our system is such that every everyone is equal before the law whether a convict or a non convict and everyone has the right to establish the in innocence before the law the eyes of the law well with these words i like to conclude my lecture thanks for your patience thank you so much thank you very much yes sir yes sir mar sake hum log khush hain I was talking about the U.S. experience. In the U.S. experience, uh, many of the studies have shown that uh, uh, executing the death, death penalty is more expensive than keeping the convict for the rest of the life. Because there, the the uh, death penalties differ from state to state. Some states hang, some states give lethal uh, lethal injection, some states choose the gas method. Yeah, so these are these are very expensive. If you look at the cost, very very astounding figures. But I am not comparing it with India. But I am only saying uh, that we have to in, in India we would uh, I would like to consider the social cost, the social cost of executing a person. You know, what happens if uh, later on it turns out that the Supreme Court was wrong, as it often as it happens in many many cases, the evidence is wrong. What happens? We have to undergo the due process of law. That is why I said, in Abdul Guru's case also, we have the due process taking place. The due process is the Home Ministry has advised rejection of the petition. Now we have a president who is sitting on it. Why she is sitting on it? Because. 
it's a complex thing supposing if uh, chidambaram is succeeded by another home minister that successor home minister will say okay i would like to reconsider the advice given by chidambaram and the advice is wrong i would like to revise my opinion after all the president is bound by the council of ministers advice so what have in many i as i have given you instances in at least 10 cases we have successive home ministers revising their views revising their opinions in the course of 5 6 years you have advani you have uh, shivraj patel chidambaram all these ministers have been revising their views what does the president do it's not the president who sits on the president uh, president who sits on the files the president wants to wait a, wait for an opportunity for a conclusive case you know where it is cl clearly shown that there is an overwhelming view that there cannot be an alternative view so she, she has no option but to sign but state will come only the president is fully convinced we have to give space to the president rather than putting pressures on her why you are not executing guru why you are not executing kasab kasab uh, case has not even come to the supreme court it's only come to the supreme court he will be given a, an opportunity to be heard starting from january 31st and then he will have the opportunity to file a mercy petition all this uh, process the elements of the due process of law has to be gone into We, there cannot be an exception to this uh, legal process because when you make an exception that will show us as a banana republic you look at the historical legacy which we had you have a strong legal tradition the democratic process all this entails a fair trial which is an element of a democratic process that doesn't this delay projects uh, the state's uh, image it does not it does not because the delay the delay shows that our systems are strong in place anybody can say you can come in and take over india you have a long time but pending in jail is not a happy matter you ha you have to suffer a sentence i don't think uh, guru is happy man he wants to be executed fast he wants a decision fast cuz what is the luxury i mean he is he, uh, he has an opportunity he has a, i don't think you are recommending that he has to be executed the moment high court confirms the sentence because like other convicts he has to be heard in the supreme court also he has the right to appeal so that's what he has done and supreme court has admitted the petition he will be heard in due process he will have an assistance to the legal counsel the court itself has appointed an amicus who will uh, will argue on his behalf probably will argue against the death sentence itself because in the eyes of the law all convicts are equal it's not the question of uh, how many number of people you kill whether you are, should be kept in a different platform it's not that case because once you are a convict you are a convict and you has to be treated with other persons thank you sir just one last question to you sir you just said that in the eyes of court and in the eyes of judiciary system of india convict is a convict it does not depend how many people he kill or she kill why is there not such an amendment which puts an example in front of people outside india inside india that brutal killing first second innocent killing uh, killing of innocent people rather and third a terrorist attack killing many people in india should be considered as a special case which should be put forward as a state of emergency i mean if that case has been given a date which is like one year later or two years later everyone knows india everyone knows that it's hardly impossible for any government to run for uh, five years continuously which exceptionally happened for past two terms but then too everyone knows the politics of india so shouldn't there be any amendment to put these such cases as the top priority and to execute these people as fast as possible to put an example of the judiciary system and the politics and the president of india should should they get united and make such amendments so you, you what, what the the factors which you are referring to are very relevant factors at the time of sentencing the sentence in the courts invariably go into the question of how brutal the crime was how many people uh, convict killed all these are relevant factors at the at the stage of sentencing and at the stage of uh, uh, sentencing being heard in the appellate courts like high courts and supreme court 
doubtless these questions will come before the Supreme Court. The because you just said that these cases are, sorry to pardon me sir, huh? you just said these cases are not yet in the eyes of Supreme Court. Why? Wait, which cases? No, it's coming. No? See, it's we, coming. In the, case of Kasab, in the case of Kasab, it has come to the Supreme How Court. How many people have cried just because of yeah. people like Kasab, just because of people like Absal Guru? And I, I would say How the, many more years? In the case of Kasab, I, I would say it's very fast. In the sense, 2008, Mumbai attack happened. You have in 2011 you have uh, is uh, petition reaching the Supreme Court. Now it will be heard in uh, January. From January it will be uh, argued and it will be heard. So I am sure the court is according a very high priority to Kasab's case because of the gravity of the offence. Besides that, you if in, res in respect of other uh, convicts, you have the due process of law being followed over the years. You have Parliament attack taking place in 2001. Then the, uh, the convict is still, uh, you know, there's the, the, a problem because Jammu and Kashmir says don't hang him. No, normally people in the rest of the India say would say, no, why consider Jammu and Kashmir's appeal? You have Rajiv Gandhi's killers, Tamil Nadu Assembly process a resolution, don't hang them. What do you do with this? It, uh, overwhelming public opinion. Now, one of the factors which uh, uh, the mitigating circumstances says that if the nation's conscience is shaken, the society's conscience is shaken, that is also a ground for commuting a sentence. But in this case, the other way around, the Tamil Nadu, because the inordinate delay in considering the mercy petitions has evoked some sort of sympathy for the convicts. The three Rajiv Gandhi uh, convicts in Tamil Nadu, they have got the sympathy of the Tamil people. Because of the inordinate delay, at the time of the incident, many people said, yes, they should be hanged. But 10 years down the line, they have a different view. But did the responsible people for the security of India, like Karkare and other men of his team, did they delay this much in putting their lives in front for the security of our, uh, of our nation? Then why the judiciary yeah. system is putting this much time? So the, the is it, isn't that unfair with the family of Karkare and correct, the people correct, like that? See, that is why the courts have uh, recently started hearing the victims uh, side also. You have victims lawyers telling the court, don't spare them, hang them, they deserve death penalty. The court hears them. It's not the question as if the court doesn't hear the victims side. It hears the victims side. You have now three sides, prosecution, the convict and the victims. The victims also saying, yes, we have, gone, we have waited for long, don't delay further, please hang them. So the court hears all this before coming to a conclusion. The question is whether they should be given an opportunity to be heard. I feel that Indian system is robust enough to give space for all this. We don't lose anything by giving uh, extra time, extra space for these people to be heard, including the victims. Victims also have a right to be heard. They are heard in the courts. Anyone for Thanksgiving? Thank you so much. You have a yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Last question. Quickly. <coughs> In the case of Dhananjay and Dhananjay Pindaji, there was more common politics over Mansur issue. Because he was a common man and not common political up level was expected after his case. But in the case of Kasab and uh, Abdul Guru, there's so much politics over that. Well, uh, in the case of Dhananjoy Chatterjee, you know, that, that was also a case of inordinate delay. The incident happens somewhere in mid-90s and he, the Supreme Court confirms the sentence in late 90s and he files a mercy petition before the governor and the governor re rejects it. Then he challenges the rejection in the High Court. The High Court says, uh, ask the governor to uh, consider the mercy petition again because the governor did not consider the mitigating material. So the, it goes back to the governor. Then when the petition is pending, he files another petition before the president. Now the, don't, please don't move. Please don't move. Thanks. So when it happens, uh, when uh, these, so uh, when Dhananjay, Dhananjay finally happened in 2004, uh, what was the immediate background? Immediate background is he challenges the rejection, rejection of the mercy petition. He challenges the uh, uh, me mercy petition uh, rejection by the president on the inordinate delay ground. The Supreme Court hears it 
and says no we don't agree there is an inordinate delay but the his counsel brings forth several factors to justify the delay the court is not convinced because in the immediate uh, period preceding the execution you have a strong public opinion in west bengal which is you know uh, which has lost patience with the whole thing and says no he deserves a death penalty because of the strong public opinion which is reflected in the newspapers the uh, court is not uh, willing to uh, re re reconsider the matter in the light of new material the president is not willing to reconsider the factors all these unfortunate things happen now in the case of uh, kasab i mean there is other way around in the sense you have yeah, televised uh, terrorist killings taking place and uh, you have a strong public opinion in favor of victims all this weighing heavily in the minds of the judges now you can't isolate yourself and decide this matters in uh, you know in independent of uh, what uh, the society and the nation at large thinks that apart i would still urge that there has to be proper guidelines in considering the messy petitions there has to be proper guidelines in uh, for the courts to consider the, uh, the rejection of the messy petitions when they are challenged